If you would, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 16, because we're going to get there in a minute. This time of year, people are talking about Christmas. People are talking about all the joy they feel. And one of the things that we, we do is we watch movies. Anybody here watching any Christmas movies so far this year? Watch a Christmas movie? My wife will watch Christmas movies in July, August, September. They're the Hallmark style ones that she'll watch year round. But there's a movie that my family owns, I think, six different versions of, called A Christmas Carol. We're all familiar with the Charles Dickens story, where you have Ebenezer Scrooge, and he's, he's warned by his longtime business partner, Jacob Marley, that he's, he's going to be visited by ghosts, and these ghosts are going to encourage him to do the right thing and learn about what Christmas really means. And I think we have a Mr. Magoo version of it from the 60s. I think we have a Smurfs version of it. I think we have a Barbie version of it. And then we have a version of the 80s starring Bill Murray. And we have another version from the 80s with George C. Scott. And I think we've got another cartoon version of it in there somewhere. But the Christmas Carol story, it resonates with us. Because everyone's like, yeah, that's a great, great thing for, for us to have this character who doesn't know what to do. And then he's... He's given this supernatural warning and he obeys it and he becomes a great and wonderful person. But there's a problem with the Christmas Carol. The problem with the Christmas Carol, we're going to look at Luke chapter 16 and I want to talk about what the problem is with the Christmas Carol. So we're going to begin in verse 10 of Luke chapter 16. Jesus is telling a story about the use of wealth and about the use of money and about the use of influence and how those things really don't matter. Just use them to the best of your benefit because those aren't great. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they get a little upset. And they didn't like this because they were very wealthy and influential people and they liked what they had. And he's basically saying, hey, you know what? People are going to use wealth for whatever they want to do. And you know, you may as well because you can't take it with you. Long story short, that's my synopsis of chapter 16 verses 1 through 9. Verse 10, he says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. Now I'm going to pause here because this sounds like it was written for the book and movie, The Christmas Carol, right? Scrooge, you can't serve wealth and your fellow man. Now, notice that in The Christmas Carol, Dickens doesn't say you can't serve wealth and God. He says you can't serve wealth and your fellow man because you're supposed to serve your fellow man. Now, we understand as Christians, one of our duties is to help our fellow man. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment, though, which kind of gets left out of the movie Christmas Carol is a problem, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? The second is like it. Jesus says elsewhere, he says, it's love your neighbor as yourself. Now the Pharisees, verse 14, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and were scoffing at him. Right? You can imagine the Pharisees sitting there going, the reason you don't say anything about wealth and you think wealth is bad because you don't got none, Jesus. You can almost picture the Pharisees. You, you're jealous of us because we have the wealth and we have the power and we have the influence and we have the money. So you're jealous of us, Jesus, and that's why you say all these things about wealth and wealthy people and misuse of wealth. That's why you talk to us because you don't have any and you wish you did. Why? Because that's how they think. You ever known somebody who obsesses over money? You ever known somebody who obsesses over power and influence? Somebody who they just want to make it the way the world is persuaded is making it? I've known some folks that were very strongly lured by worldly desires for power, wealth, influence, etc. People will do a lot of things they shouldn't do to go after those things. And the Pharisees who've got those things, 
they probably didn't necessarily get it. Okay, we know the Pharisees were not really good about obeying what God said they should do, were they? They weren't good about that. They had done the exact opposite. In fact, they would do things like say, oh, you know what? Instead of taking care of your parents, you should say, these dollars are dedicated to the temple. And they would have been the dollars dedicated to you, mom and dad, but I can't be bothered to take care of you because the, the specific dollars that I was going to use for you, they're going to God instead. So I can keep the rest, right? They, they played shell games with their money, okay? You know, we, we would think of it as tax loopholes or whatever you want. However you want to envision it to get a modern comparison, they would say, okay, if I've got $100, I'm going to say that you know, the law says I'm supposed to take 10% of those dollars and give them to take care of my parents because my parents raised me, they took care of me, they provided for me for all those years. The law says I should take 10%, and I'll say, these are the 10%, these $10 right here would have gone to my parents, but guess what, parents? I'm going to donate those $10 to the church, to the synagogue, so that the temple, the synagogue, etc., gets those $10, and you don't. And I'm going to say, I get credit for both helping you with the money that I didn't spend on you, and with serving God with the money I gave there. And so I don't have to spend as much money, and I get all the benefit of being a good Pharisee. That's literally how the Pharisees view things. And so this is the attitude and mindset of people that Jesus is dealing with here, and they scoff at him because he says, you need to understand, you need to use your things appropriately. So that's verse 14 of Luke 16. So he's, he's going to relate to them a story and there have been some scholars who debate whether this is a parable or whether this is an actual story. I'm not going to take either side. The reason people say it's a parable is because it fits in with his parables. And the reason people say it's not a parable is because if it's not a parable, or if it is a parable, it's the only one where he ever uses a person's personal name. Okay? So, I don't know, and it doesn't really matter. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, He's going to transition. He says, now I'm going to tell you a parable. Now I'm going to tell you a story. He transitions immediately to say, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Who does that sound like? That sounds like the Pharisees. That's acting like the Pharisees. He says, there's a guy that lived like you. He says, there was a guy that lived like you. He doesn't say, you know, I'm going to tell you a parable. He says, there's a guy that lived like you. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides even the dogs were coming around and licking his sores. He says, you have the contrast. You have the person who has everything. Who according to your worldview, Pharisees, is the peak. He's the epitome of life. And then you contrast him with the lowest of the low. A sickly beggar living in front of your gate who wishes he could eat the crumbs from your table and the dogs are coming and licking his sores. He can't even keep the dogs away from him. He's got these open wounds and the dogs are licking the open wounds. It's going to be disgraceful and humiliating and painful. But he can't even keep the dogs away from himself. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now, you'll notice the poor man doesn't even get a burial. Right? Burial was very important in Jewish culture. In fact, burial with your family and your ancestors was one of the... They, they didn't understand the concept of the afterlife the same way we do. And so all the way throughout the Old Testament and up into the early parts of the New Testament, they focus on where do you get buried. Right? There's a man of God from Judah in the early days of the kingdom who is slain by uh, lions, and a prophet nearby says, bury him with my family. Right? 
when Jacob and his family all go down to Egypt, Jacob dies and he makes his sons carry him all the way up to be buried where Abraham and Isaac and Sarah and Rebekah are all buried at the cave of Machpelah. And when Joseph dies, he makes them promise, you're going to take my bones out of here and bury them with my family. Okay? Because burial mattered. That's just a brief little aside here. Burial mattered. Because that was how they viewed you are going to the actual, kind of like the Egyptians and the Native Americans and all sorts of other groups. They, they didn't have a good concept of heaven and the afterlife because it hadn't been explained to them because Jesus hadn't come and done it yet. Okay? So the poor man dies and he's carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man dies and is buried. That's what we're given. In Hades, notice this does not say hell, this says Hades, which is a Greek word for the place of the dead. It is not the word for eternal torment, which could be Gehenna or Tartarus. In Hades, the place of the dead, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, so apparently it's not great there where he is, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So he can look and he can recognize Lazarus. He knows who Lazarus was, the poor guy that was outside his gate every day. He knows that poor guy was there outside his gate every day. But apparently, what did he do for that poor guy outside his gate every day? Nothing. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to there, from here to you, will not be able, and that none may cross from over there to us. So, in this place of the dead, you have this place of the dead called Hades. You have this place of torment. And in the place of torment, the rich man who didn't do what was right is being tormented. And in the other part of the place of the dead, where they can see and apparently communicate with each other from there, you have Abraham and you have Lazarus. And he says, look, I can't get to you. You can't get to me. We can't contact and reach each other. You can't come here, I can't go there. That's just the way it works. I say that because the Christmas carol, you have the dead guy who's being tormented, you know, coming back and doing all sorts of other stuff. doesn't work that way. Verse 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Now, what's the ultimate irony of that last statement? What's the ultimate irony of what they just said there? You know, one, we could look at the, the whole Christmas story, th or Christmas carol thing and say, well, clearly this blows that story out of the water. And it's a fun story to watch, but it's really not scripturally sound. But the ultimate irony of this is Jesus is saying, in the story he's telling them, even if someone rises from the dead, your brothers won't believe this guy. Who do you think Jesus was talking about there? I think it's pretty clear Jesus is talking about himself. Because, one, he has raised people from the dead. During his ministry on earth, he raised people from the dead on several occasions. Okay, there was Jairus' daughter, there was the son of the widow of name, there was Lazarus. There were several times when Jesus physically raised someone from the dead. These were not all late in his ministry. Lazarus was probably pretty late in his ministry, but the other two weren't necessarily late in his ministry. He physically raised someone from the dead. And did the Pharisees and Sadducees ever listen to him because of that? Anybody know what it says in John chapter 11? 
after he raises Lazarus from the dead? I'm going to turn over to John chapter 11. So turn over to John chapter 11 with me briefly. Because <clears throat> remember, these are the same people that it's talking about when it says, you know, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees. Okay, so in John chapter 11, after he has raised Lazarus from the dead, beginning in verse 45, it says, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Once again, the Pharisees, who did they make it all about? Themselves. They said, if this guy is doing these miraculous things, were they good miracles or bad miracles? He's healing people, he's casting out demons, he's raising people from the dead. And the Pharisees said, we don't care that he's doing all these things and the people are being helped and God is being glorified. We don't care about that. What we care about is, what does this mean for us? If we let this guy do this, then the Romans are going to say, hey, you guys aren't in charge of your country anymore. This guy is. They're going to come take away our place and our nation. That's what they said. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. So they say, we would rather kill the person who's doing all these good things than let the good things happen. How much of an attitude issue is that? Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, verse 51, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. They decided they're going to kill Jesus because he's doing good. So Jesus, who has been raising people from the dead and who says, even if somebody comes back from the dead, you won't believe them, is confronted by the Pharisees because they want to kill him. Now, John explains in John chapter 11, that's actually a prophecy. The priest says, once again, another ironic statement, it's better for one man to die for the nation. What did Jesus do? He died for the nation. And John explains, not just the nation, but for everybody. But here's the question. How much hope did the rich man have at this point in time? In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, parable or not, how much hope does he have at that point in time? No hope. He has no hope. Why does he have no hope? Because we have our opportunity here on earth today. It is my opportunity to choose to serve God, to choose to love God, to choose to obey God, to choose to spread his gospel, to choose all those things or to choose anything else. And I need to realize that before I die. One of my favorite passages is back in the book of Joshua. I'm going to turn to the book of Joshua briefly. Chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua was about to die. Joshua was a, he was an impressive man. In fact, Joshua is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Because Joshua, starting as a young man, is Moses' right-hand man. He is the guy that Moses leans on, and he goes with Moses, and he wants to do what's right the whole time. Joshua is the one that Moses sends to lead the men into battle. Joshua is the one that he sends to spy out the land of Canaan. And Joshua is the one who, when Moses dies at the rightful age of 120, he says, Joshua, you're the boss. And what we find out is Joshua apparently raised up a generation of Israelites so that at the end of Joshua it says, that they were faithful to God throughout all the time of Joshua and throughout all the time of the, the leaders who survived him. The whole next generation is still faithful, which is better than we can say about a lot of people, that the next generation is still faithful even through their time period because 
quite frankly, that's one of the mistakes leaders make, is they try to micromanage and do everything themselves for too long. You know, the early church started falling apart when some of the leaders in the early church tried to take too much control and power, and you've got the Catholic church and all sorts of other things coming. You have to make sure that you're not only helping run things, but that you're preparing the next generation. And so Joshua, at the end of his life, in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua, makes an interesting statement. He says, God's done all sorts of stuff for us. This is not a brief recap. God's done all sorts of amazing and wonderful things for us. Now, verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. He flat out comes and says, choose God. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, you make a choice. Today, you make a choice. Guess what? Every day, you make a choice. When you walk out of here, you'll make a choice. Are you going to be serving God, or are you going to be serving anything else? When you get up tomorrow morning, you'll make a choice. Are you going to be serving God or are you going to be serving absolutely anything else? We're not going to get miraculous messengers coming from the dead to talk to us. We already got the only miraculous messenger we're going to get coming back from the dead to talk to us about. It. And he left us his words in the Bible. We're not going to get Jacob Marley in the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. We got Jesus. And he is so much better than any and all of those. And so today, and every day, you need to make that choice. I need to make that choice. We all need to make that choice. Who will we serve? Will we serve God? Or will we serve anyone or anything else? If you have not made that decision with your life, we have that opportunity. Maybe there's still water in the back of the Water in the back? Who knows? We, you know what? We've... We opened it one time, there was no water in this baptistry. We went down to the river, and it was January, and it was 41 degrees. It was a different experience. But it was it was it was an experience. If you haven't made the decision to be baptized, we'll find a way to make that happen. If you have been baptized, but you haven't found a way to live your life and you know you've messed up and need to come back, we're here for you. We can pray with you, we can talk to you, we can study with you. If there's anything you need. Please come forward while we stand and say.